Welcome to Wild Turkey Science, a podcast made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow. I'm Dr. Marcus Lashley, Professor of Wildlife Ecology at the University of Florida. And I'm Dr. Will Goolsby, Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Management at Auburn University. We're both lifelong hunters and devoted scientists who are passionate about hunting, managing, and researching wild turkeys. In this podcast, we'll explore turkey research, speak to the experts in the field, and address the difficult questions related to wild turkey ecology and management. Our goal is to serve as your connection to to wild wild turkey turkey science. Yeah, we're here today with Dr. Dwayne Elmore. And um, Dwayne, I'll let you introduce yourself and... um, We'll get started on this conversation. Well, thanks both of you to, uh, for allowing me to come on here and join you today. Um, my background is um, I, gr- I grew up in Tennessee uh, hunting and fishing and spent a lot of time outdoors and went to the University of Tennessee and then Mississippi State University and then eventually Utah State University. And, and now I've been at Oklahoma State University for 16 years and um, I do a lot of uh, extension work. Um, focused on providing technical assistance to landowners and agencies and also research. And a lot of my uh, work, especially in the area of research is on game birds. So quail, grouse, um, and more recently turkey. So I'm obviously very excited to talk to y'all today about um, predator control in the context of turkey management. Yeah. Well, we're really excited to have you as well. I know uh, a lot of our listeners are really interested in some of the ongoing turkey work in different places and it's nice to have somebody that's leading some of that research from oklahoma so thanks for coming on yeah absolutely i'm excited about it too from the standpoint of you know marcus and i have been having this ongoing conversation about predators and turkeys and we've pulled in some stuff related to other game birds here and there as well but you know you've worked with such a diversity of those species and anytime you broaden that scope out in terms of the what species you're willing to review studies from it you know pulls in a greater diversity of information that we can use to draw on so even if the the question that we're interested in answering isn't directly there in the turkey literature maybe it's there um in the quail literature or or vice versa you know something along those lines yeah i think that's a great point will and i know you guys have already done a podcast very specific to turkey and predator management um so if the listener hasn't heard that one yet, I would encourage them to do so. Uh, And as I'm sure y'all have covered, there's actually pretty limited direct evidence specific to wild turkey as to what the effect would be of doing targeted predator control or predator removal, which is kind of astounding when you think about it. I Mm -hmm. mean, wild turkey is an intensively studied animal. I mean, we've done a lot of research and a tremendous amount of research has identified predators as a, you know, leading cause of nest loss or, or poult uh, mortality, or in some cases, adult mortality. And so the fact that there's not more evidence uh, about what would happen if we actually targeted those predators uh, as far as a uh, change in turkey demographics is a little bit eye-opening, to, to, I think, to all of us. Um, so in, in a case like that, we do have to look at the broader literature Uh, especially species that are similar. Mm -hmm. So we might think of other ground nesting game birds like grouse or quail or partridge or pheasant or even waterfowl. And when you look into that body of literature, it's, it's, there's a lot, there's actually a lot of work that's been done, particularly in the area of waterfowl. Um, And, and, you know, there's mixed results, obviously not every study has found a positive effect on the prey uh, you know, whether it's waterfowl or partridge, but there definitely is um, some things I think that we can glean from that literature that is relative to wild turkey. Yeah, that's one of the things that, that we've been talking about, Will and I, ad nauseum, and we've gone into some of that other literature and particularly one study that was a review of, I don't even remember what it was now, Will, it was over 100 species of birds and uh you know some of them were game birds and very similar to turkeys and of 
majority of them were not even ground nesting and, you know, non-game and all over the world. And it was really interesting to see the variability across studies. And it was, we went from, you know, there's quite a few examples of it having a negative effect to many examples having a really strong positive effect. And then we kind of looked into those. And it's interesting you brought up the waterfowl because I think it is related to one of those, I guess, caveats that we had to look, you know, look into more detail under the hood to see what was going on. But there were quite a few studies where there, the uh, studies were on islands, for instance, where the predator trapping or removal in that case was really strongly uh, positive for the, the bird populations, which typically were non-game imperiled species, if I recall. So uh, I guess uh, since you brought up the waterfowl, that's kind of the first thing that jumped into my head of something that might be a parallel on why it's been so well studied in that system. Yeah, and in the case of waterfowl, you know, a lot of these uh, studies have been conducted in areas where there's really high nesting densities. Like you can have multiple uh, hens nesting at the same time within just a space of a few acres. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a situation where we would anticipate potential really intensive predator control making a difference because you you can concentrate your efforts. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, in some cases, these are islands. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, they're either man-made man or they've like taken a peninsula that extends out into a lake and they've cut it off and created an island or, in, or sometimes they're natural islands or they fence them off yeah. to keep a lot of predators out, but that's not a hundred percent solution. You know, Raccoons can swim. Mm -hmm. Raccoons can climb fences. So it's not keeping everything out, but it definitely makes it harder for the predators to get at the prey. Um, so those are situations where we would anticipate a higher likelihood of success. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think that's overall what the waterfowl literature shows. But even in areas where prey is more dispersed, say, let's look, think about red grouse in Scotland or gray partridge in Europe. Um, there's some pretty compelling evidence of research in those areas that even with more dispersed prey, which might be more comparable to wild turkey or bobwhite mm -hmm. or something here in North America, that you can, with under certain conditions, you can uh, see some measures, some vital rate measures increase. So I guess that's the first major point I'd like to make while um, I understand why we as biologists, and I'm pointing to myself here because I'm just as guilty of this as anybody, but I understand why we're often hesitant to talk about predator control. Um, we cannot say that there's no evidence that predator control doesn't work. That's just not, that's not accurate. There is evidence. It's not uniform. There's variation. There's lots of things that, um, you know, might cause variation in response, but the literature is it does have plenty of examples where predator control has met some target objective for a game species. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Yeah, and and Marcus, I'd like to touch on a point that Dwayne made real briefly, if we can, because I, I think it's something that you and I have kind of touched on in some of our recent previous episodes, but I've never directly addressed is that if it ever comes off as is us being negative or hesitant to recommend predator control or give it a, a glowing endorsement. Of course, we covered all sorts of reasons why that might be. But the one that first comes to mind for me when I start discussing this with a landowner or manager is that I feel like it gets moved up too high in the hierarchy list on their, on their to-do list um, mm -hmm. when it comes to managing a property in and really, you know, there's a lot of other foundational aspects of a management plan that should be addressed, particularly habitat concerns, before I think we get to that point. Would you agree with that, Dwayne? Absolutely. I, I mean, the word you said, hierarchy, I think is the one that landowners need to burn into their brain because it is a hierarchy of needs. And all of us have probably been on so many properties where they want to talk about predator control and you're looking around, it's like, there's no cover. Where would a bird even nest? I mean, there's no food resources. There's no roosting trees. I mean, there is nothing here 
for Turkey. So in a situation like that, obviously, it's kind of a moot point to worry about predators because you've got such higher needs to address first. And I think that's why, as you say, Will, that often we're reluctant to talk to landowners, uh, you know, and become maybe a little evasive about it. Um, So, and I think that landowners need to recognize that and that they need to address the most limiting factor first, but that doesn't mean that they're mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. You know, both can be operating at the same time. Yeah. What I've said before is I, I want predator I want trapping to be part of my toolbox. I don't want that taken away from me. Mm -hmm. But I think that because so often we see that these other, uh, these other items in that hierarchy of needs have not been addressed yet, that we may, we maybe sometimes swing too far in the opposite direction by avoiding the topic of predator control completely. When really we should be taking more of a middle ground approach, a more nuanced approach by saying, Mm -hmm. yes, we think it's something that could be a viable alternative to achieve your desired objectives but let's let's move that aside for a little while and make sure we got everything else addressed first and once we do we may find that we don't even need to tap into that or we may find that we that we want to get that extra you know five squeeze that extra five or ten percent increase in abundance whatever it might be out of our population we we added in later down the road but we've already potentially added you know many times more percentage points to our population by addressing those higher priority items. Yeah, that's in fact, if you look at the literature, the play, the examples where there has been uh, an, an effect from predator control, I mean, it, it's typically where there's great habitat. I mean, you think about the bobwhite mm-hmm. literature in South Georgia, and North Florida, where they've clearly demonstrated uh, an increase in autumn bobwhite population densities with predator control well it's it's in the context of the habitat is about as perfect as you could make it i mean we don't know what else to do to make it any better for bobwhite and also they've done camera surveys to determine that the predator numbers are high so there's a high number of predators and there's good habitat well those are situations where you might expect it to actually to matter but if you if you're not to that point um you could be spinning your wheels. Well, I think another important thing about that, first of all, in the situation that you were just speaking of with quail, the habitat got addressed. Mm -hmm. And that moved the predator issue up in hierarchy. But the other thing, and I think that's a perfect part of the world to talk about it, is the habitat wasn't addressed at the property level. It was at the landscape level. Yep. Which is another issue entirely. So, you know, you're a, a landowner might essentially be an island. If you have addressed habitat on your property, it still might not be addressed at a broader landscape, uh, which is something that, you know, is probably important to consider and thinking about trying to bring landowners together on habitat might be just as important. I hear that. Um, you know, getting everybody on the same page with trapping, but I don't hear it very commonly with everybody getting on the same page about habitat and how important that could be for uh, meeting your objective. Yeah. I mean, if you, you know, if you control or own 200 acres, um, your property doesn't, does not meet all of the requirements for a population of wild turkey. I mean, they're clearly using your neighbor's property and, even in a good year, you might only have a couple of nests on your property. Mm-hmm. So even if you were able to eliminate all the potential nest predators, for example, um, just by random chance alone, you might not even have a nest on your property that year. And if you did, you know, there's other things that get nests too. Mm-hmm. So the point is the smaller scale that we go down to, the less likelihood that those management actions are going to have a measurable effect that you would ever notice. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something people have to be realistic about, you know, when they're, when they're contemplating, am I going to put resources into this action or not? Right. So best case scenario, Dwayne, you know, let's say we've got a property that meets the criteria that you described as far as the habitat is about as perfect as it can be. And we know that there's a high predator abundance in that area. 
within within the non turkey game bird literature, what would what is it? And maybe that maybe this it ranges too widely for you to answer it simply, but you know what kind of percentages are we talking about here in terms of an increase in response to predator control? It, yeah, it does range very widely, but we can we can definitely throw some uh, ideas out for the listener. Just within the bob white world, you know, there's studies that have shown no effect up to maybe thirty or forty percent increase in autumn density. Um, so even in one species, there's a lot of variation and we, you know, you can talk all day about why those different studies have different effects. I mean, some of it's, I think Mark has hit on it, scale, the scale of the property, how big of an area is good habitat, how big of an area was their targeted trapping on, but, you know, both Bob White, we've seen definitely in the twenties and 30% increase. Some of the literature from Europe is even more dramatic. I mean, there's a study on gray partridge that fi- found a three and a, th- a three and a half times increase in autumn fall population density, and th- th- that's really dramatic. So it's it's variable, and um, the, there's some there's some things you can glean though from the literature of what what circumstances would we expect to see that the any increase, and I think. We've hit on some of these, but just to reiterate, you have to first have a situation where there is a predator that affects the prey. And that seems silly to say, right? I mean, well, yeah, of course, but I think sometimes the wrong predator can get targeted, all right? Uh, if, if, you're, if you're worried mostly about nest success and you're trapping coyotes, you could be shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, coyotes do prey on other predators that might be a bigger problem for you like skunks and armadillos and opossums. So you've got to target the right predator. That's one. It's got to be intensive. It's got to be targeted to your resource concern. For example, wild turkey, if you're trapping nest predators in July and most of the dispersal of those nest predators is happening throughout the fall, then by spring, when they're actually nesting, you may be back to the same carrying capacity of of predators on your property that you otherwise would have. So it's got to be targeted at the right time of year on a large scale. And again, habitat can't be the most limiting factor. So if those conditions are met, those are situations where we might expect some response, uh, but that response is highly variable between species, studies, and even between years. I guess I, I wanted to ask you, Duane, and that, circumstance where there was a three and a half fold i think that i don't think we've seen anything like that from the other literature that that's i mean incredible that that positive what what were the circumstances where that happened do you like do you know what the, like what predators were they doing the intensity scale any of those those kinds I don't of re- i don't recall the intensity um I do know that fox was one of the fox and carrion crow and magpie. I just pulled this up. Uh, I can tell you that they were targeting those species of fox, carrion crow, and magpie during the nesting period. So remember, I just went through those criteria. One of them was targeting the right predator. Those are all the right predators. Those all do prey on partridge nest, mm-hmm. and they ta- and they did it at the right time. They were doing it right at and during the nesting period. Um, I'm not sure how big of an area they did that over. It was a six-year experiment, though, so it was a long time. It wasn't a little shot in the pan, and then they're done with it. Yeah. Well, and I'm assuming they probably monitored many, many nests. That was one issue that we had with some of the turkey Mm -hmm. research is they literally didn't even have double digits of nests they followed per year. Yeah. Uh, across treatments so Mm -hmm. uh, and this is something that we as turkey researchers need to address i know the three of us have talked about this like (laughs) we we really need a study or studies multiple studies that tries to get a better handle on on what the effect size might be for wild turkey because (laughs) right now when a landowner comes and asks me this question i mean i feel like you know, and I don't mind having this conversation. I love talking about this stuff, but I feel like I've got to talk to them for an hour to give them an honest answer. It's not a yes or no. If they say, yeah. should I do predator control? I can't in good conscience say yes or no. It's, it's just way more complicated. 
Yeah, we were talking about hesitancy earlier and that how how someone might interpret that. And that's my issue. I don't know what I don't I don't have good a good foundation of data to feel comfortable telling people, yeah, you need to go do it or no, it's not gonna work at all. You know, I, I don't really know. <laughs> And uh-huh. if you draw, if you look at the broader literature base, there are certainly circumstances where it can be really effective if it's done in the correct context and scale, so, and timing and, and uh, intensity, it, like it. So one of the one of the things I think that makes this so interesting with turkeys is that we hunt them in spring versus fall or winter, like a lot of these other game birds that we have good data on you know, predator removal, increasing their fall or winter populations. And so, um, Marcus, I don't know if you remember, I don't remember if it was speak. I think it was love at Williams study that we talked about in that previous episode where they mentioned that they had some uncertainty as to how well the increases in production that they documented would translate into spring populations and the primary reason that they cited for that that translation not occurring um, was that, you know, you get dispersal, you get migration to, you know, from fall, fall home ranges to spring to spring home ranges. And um, that, you know, you may send you may have created a bunch of new birds, but you send them off to somebody else. And so I think that that's one of the the unique aspects of looking at this issue as it pertains to turkeys is that. You know, there's some fall hunting that occurs, of course, but by and large, people hunt them in spring. And we don't know how those population gains would necessarily translate for that species. Yeah, and several of the studies that we've mentioned today, um, that's, they have noted that the results were short-lived. If there was a positive effect, it was short-lived. So they often measured an increase in the fall autumn density of these prey animals, but by the next season, there ne- not, wasn't necessarily a higher number of, of the prey in the breeding population. Now, it, so Will, your point's exact, uh, this is a great one. You know, if we're worried about how many birds we're carrying over to the spring, um, that makes some of these other studies, you, not, you don't throw them out the window because it's the best we have to go on, but right. you certainly have to kind of go into looking at them with eyes wide open and realize that not everything about those studies is transferable to wild turkey. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, it seems seems like even from the the review, the big meta analysis that I was talking about earlier, that that was one of the major points that they made is that you see, you see, I guess, as you said, a short lived effect where you see this positive effect on nesting success and then fledging success and then sometimes that's carried into the fall populations but it was actually fairly inconsistent even if that occurred uh, best i recall and then uh i know that it said the uh effect size was far diminished by the time you looked at how much of a breeding population change there was in the next spring and uh i mean that that's definitely an important consideration to think about, you know, it's not just let's get more nests to hatch. There's a lot of stuff going on in there. And then some of it may not be re- related to predators or it may be compensatory for to predators. Yeah. So I think, you know, the take home from all this is that um, you have to target the right thing at the right time before you would even possibly expect there to be an effect And then it's like, you know, most any other management, if there was an effect, it was meeting your objectives, you're going to have to maintain it. You can't expect if you knock a possum density down dramatically, you can't expect that to stay. There's going to be immigration and new Mm -hmm. births and they're going to fill that gap in. And, you know, I've. I've been guilty in the past of kind of using that as an example to throw predator control out the window. Because, in you know, I think in my mind, I was thinking, well, it's just so short lived. And then I remember one day kind of having an epiphany, like, yeah, I kind of like prescribed fire. You know, I have no problem recommending someone repeatedly burn every two or three years, but I'm not, I'm being a little hypocritical mm-hmm. if I'm throwing out a whole management tool 
just because I have to redo it. I mean, mm. everything is a non-equilibrium, right? Mm-hmm. Everything is changing. The plant community is changing. Predator prey numbers are changing. So we kind of have to accept that anything we do is short-lived. That doesn't mean that you should go out and start trapping predators, which willy-nilly. But I do think it means that you have to think about all these practices as, am I able and willing to maintain this over time? Mm-hmm. You know, year after year. And for some they're not. And for some managers, they are, you know, that's, it's going to vary. It's just interesting to me, I guess the, on the, I'm failing on, on the right vocabulary, but the human dimensions of the subject, like when I hear people talk about, Oh, I'm doing everything I can for turkeys. I mean, I'm trapping raccoons, but that's the first thing always. Mm-hmm. I'm trapping. And then if you, you know, with biologists, it, there seems to be this other, I don't want to say polar opposite, but there's two, like two sides to this where they tend to avoid or they really negative toward predator trapping. It's just interesting. Why? Like, why is it so uh, polarizing? I guess it's so interesting to me. I think, you know, speaking for me personally, one of the things that I've thought a lot about is looking across the pond, you know, what's happened in the UK, Um, got a situation with red grouse where they're intensively managed and there's intensive predator control and they have these crazy high numbers of red grouse. I mean, you know, off the charts, like probably never has existed on earth prior in the past, you know, to the past 50 to 100 years. Um, But that's created a lot of public backlash especially related to the predator control. You know, Mm -hmm. a lot of the public in the UK, they don't hunt and they really question killing thousands or tens of thousands of predators, some legally, some illegally, Mm -hmm. actually, uh, you know, just to get more birds to shoot. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, that's a valid thing for society to consider. And I think that's something that all of us is, uh, wildlife managers and hunters have to think about, you know, like how far, even if, I mean, as researchers, we want to know the answer. We want to know like, what is, what is the potential effect? But that's not the end of the discussion. Mm -hmm. I think you have to take it a step further and say, okay, now we know this is what the effect is likely to be. Is it worth it? And when I say worth it, I mean, are we okay with doing that? Is mm-hmm. society okay with doing that? What are the potential ramifications and consequences to broader land management, hunting, et cetera? And I, th- I think we can't skirt that. I mean, I think it's uncomfortable to talk about, mm-hmm. but it's a conversation we all need to be having. I see Will. He's squirming around in his seat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just yeah. thinking like, you know, uh, this is oversimplif- oversimplification, but, you know, that's what people like to do when they, when they don't agree with something, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's easy to see, you know, somebody could, uh, you know, put it on a bumper sticker saying, you know, these people want to kill more animals just so they can kill more animals. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of what we're doing. And I'm not saying I agree with that sentiment whatsoever, but it's very easy for them to paint predator control in a negative light. Um, But just, you know, playing devil's advocate here, because I have had a very similar conversation to this one that we're having right now with a variety of folks over the years. And um, the res- their response to me oftentimes is they're not going to like what we do regardless. So I might as well just go ahead and do what I think is best for my situation. What do you guys think about that? I mean, is there, is there, maybe that's an impossible question to answer or unfair one, but, but is there, Brian, you're the guest here. So. <laughs> oh yeah. I saw you looking at me, <laughs> but, but is there, you know, is that a valid, is that a valid point? Or do you think that the way we portray ourselves as hunters can, you know, ensure that we get to enjoy what we do for longer? I, th- I mean, personally, I'm, I'm torn on it. I'm pretty independent in my nature and, I definitely, uh, you know, I I definitely have a strong personal conviction about what I what I think is is ethical or not ethical. 
Uh, but I also recognize that my ethics aren't the same as everybody else's. And I have, to, even though I may feel strongly about something, you know, I, th- I think we, we have to be good citizens too. And uh, that doesn't mean we're always going to agree. Like, like your bumper st- sticker example, Will, you know, I don't agree with that sentiment personally, but I sure understand how somebody would feel that way, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I think I have to be pa- compassionate and sympathetic to, to how they feel. And that may not mean that I'm going to stop predator control if I was doing it, but I, f- I feel like I have to have an honest conversation about it and, you know, and try to try to see their, their side of the story um, and, you know, explain why I'm doing what I'm doing and listen to the, that means also listening to them as to why they feel the way they feel. Mm-hmm. So I think if we all just treated each other with a little more respect, um, you know, we could work through some of these really challenging circumstances, challenging societal conflict. But but it's there whether we want to talk about it or not. And uh, and it can change policy. Mm-hmm. And that's something you have to think about. I mean, if enough people feel a certain way, this is a democracy. And it can change policy, ultimately. Well, I think it does matter how we portray what we do as sportsmen, because, I mean, a a case in point of that is I feel like I don't have data on this because it's not the type of of thing that I really research, but uh, I'm sure you could get out there and dig in and find some. But um, it's been my impression over the past decade or so that people are viewing hunting in an increasingly positive light, you know, with the whole field to table movement. Um, And understanding that it's, you know, human consumption of organic meat that came from a sustainable resource. And I think that's that's shown a very positive light on hunting that what maybe wasn't once there before. So I just use that as an example is, you know, it probably does matter how we portray ourselves to the public in terms of what we do when it comes to hunting and with management. Yeah. And. You know, it's all of this is very context specific. Like if you just ask someone, do you support predator control? And you don't give them any background. They're probably not even going to know what to say. I mean, if I didn't, if I wasn't in this field and if I didn't grow up hunting, I don't know how I would answer that. And and there are some data out there. Like Terry Mesmer did a great study uh, years ago looking at when and how people might support predator control. And one of the findings from that study was it was very context specific. When, when you were talking about doing predator control for a species that was threatened or endangered, or even just declining, like a species that had a lot of conservation concern, the overwhelming majority of the non-hunting public, they were behind it. Mm -hmm. Like they were okay with doing predator control. That doesn't mean they're going to be okay with predator control for a very abundant animal just because we want to shoot more of them. And again, I'm not, I'm not telling anybody how to feel about that. I'm not saying what your ethics should be on that, but you have to understand those are very different contexts and the public are, they're going to see those differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, like you said, with, you know, in some other places that, that has really, come up and and influenced policy to the degree that mm-hmm. people are losing you know the opportunity to hunt so i think that's a you know that's definitely from my perspective it you know this is another one of those things that's ethics and it ethical based and and everybody has their own set of ethics uh, well and in some places they've already lost the ability to control predators yeah frank you know at least probably effectively so like colorado mm-hmm. you can't use dogs to hunt uh black bear well if if black bear were limiting a big game species in colorado it becomes very difficult even for the state agency mm-hmm. all of a sudden to, to deal with that situation so and we've seen situations where the ability to even target predators has been greatly reduced in parts of the country mm-hmm. So one of the things that you mentioned, Dwayne, was, um, you know, context specific acceptance of predator removal and um, some of the, you know, one of those criteria that you mentioned was a species that, that is in decline, which, you know, in many places, we've got some data suggesting that turkeys, turkey harvest is decreasing. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so that could at least partially satisfy that. Um, but it seems like another one that might put people more in favor of accepting predator control would be increasing predator populations. Yes. And I know, and I know you mentioned something about, you know, speaking to trends related to predator populations. Would you like to expand on that a little bit? Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, that's, that's something very pertinent to this is that, you know, a lot of these predators that we've been talking about today, we know their numbers have dramatically increased over the past few decades. Um, and, and, you know, we have better data on some than others. You know, we have really good data on uh, raptors. Of course, you know, raptors are protected, so there's we can't we can't alter their numbers, but we can change uh, their ability. And for some prey, we can change their ability to be effective hunters by changing the vegetation. Uh, so maybe indirectly, but for some of these predators that we know have increased, they're not, uh, it's not legal. It's not, it's not on, on the table, but for others like raccoons, uh, you know, I'll give you a personal story here that I, I kind of is laughable to even say this, but when I was in high school and, you know, everybody I knew coon hunted, everybody had coon dogs and that's how we spent our, our evenings, uh, you know, chasing these coon hounds around the hills and haulers of middle Tennessee and it was a big deal to treat two raccoons in a night. That was a big deal. I mean, I, we were excited about that. That seems laughable now. Can you imagine? Mm-hmm. I don't think you could turn a coon hound loose and not have it treed within five minutes. I mean, there, the number of raccoons just in my short lifetime has changed dramatically, as have lots of other predators. So that is, that's changed the equation in a couple of situations. One, that past studies that were looking at the potential effects of predators on prey may not be as applicable today as we think they are because the predator communities are so different. We have That's to, a really good point. have to acknowledge that. Mm-hmm. Secondly, but to your point, Will, I think about the social acceptance, you know, people are going to perceive a raccoon very differently than they are a gray wolf. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's a life changing event for somebody to see a gray wolf for most people and yeah. raccoons, you know, they're in their garbage, you know, they're they're getting in their attic. I mean, everybody recognizes this is a very abundant animal and most people would probably even recognize that it's become more abundant over time. Yeah. But then at the same time, you have you have a whole movement that's trying to glorify possums now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's talking about how. They, you know, they function as an ecosystem service by by eating as many ticks as they do. And, you know, so I guess they're working working towards both ends on that one. Yeah, they're <laughs> dead end for a bunch of viruses and their body temperature too, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that, so that's a, another interesting topic and it'd be fun to, to hear, Dwayne. Okay, let, let's say with raccoons, uh, I think the general – the general turkey hunter, at least the ones that I see online, would agree that, you know, they have increased in abundance to a degree that's really problematic for turkeys. Uh, that, you know, that's, I think, a pretty common theme. And then the next thing that you usually see when somebody writes about it or you hear somebody talk about it is that's because we don't have anybody trapping for fur anymore. Do you think that that is? driving that change in populations or is it other factors or some combination like why? i think that i think it's a combination yeah i mean you know even in my high school era we weren't killing them we we would tree and release yeah. you know often well you didn't want uh, to get rid of the only two you had to tree right no i know you <laughs> might not ever find them again uh but you know my my father's generation a lot of people were eating them. So there was definitely way more utilitarian use of a lot of these meso predators, especially back when there weren't a lot of uh, other things for people to, to eat like white tailed deer. Um, so that, that's, that has changed, but also we've done so many things to be favorable to raccoons. Uh, like how about deer feeders? I mean, everybody in Oklahoma has deer feeders all across their property. And you know where most of that feed is going? In the belly of a raccoon. I mean, just put a, if you don't believe that, put a camera up over your feeder. 
you'll have seven, eight, nine raccoons every night just yeah. gorging themselves. You, you think that doesn't have an effect on not only predator abundance, but predator distribution and concentration? Yeah. No. I, oh, yeah. They're, they're, sorry. Go ahead, Marcus. <laughs> you, you seemed really excited. So I think go I, ahead. I, I think I, 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 the sore I, subject here. <laughs> I was, I, <laughs> I was just going to say, I mean, that people are people are sufficiently cognizant of the fact of the coon visitation rates to their feeders that there's they're standing up a whole industry of, you know, raccoon exclusion Mm -hmm. and resistance devices that people are putting on feeders now, Mm -hmm. like these teeth and stuff like that that they put on the the legs of the feeder. Um, So they're very aware of that. But I, I don't know if they they make as direct connection between, you know, how that. You're, they're just thinking about the raccoon waste of their feed that they want to go to another animal. They're yeah. not thinking about how that could potentially change abundance or distribution of a predator. Well, no, I can say we, we've had a whole bunch of studies on feeding. Uh, none of them were really about, well, there probably are a couple about raccoons, but the ones I was looking at are not about raccoons, but raccoons are very typically the number one visitor and user even if you calculate how much of the feed is being eaten by different species they actually rank top in almost every study within the range of raccoons it is Uh, so that's pretty interesting but that this does strike a nerve because with when you talk to people about you know potential turkey declines and what what are the causes and people are really ready to jump on blaming predators particularly raccoons and then we you know people get upset if you say well trapping might not be the best solution but those many of them the same people are willing to go out and put feeders up all over the place where the number Mm -hmm. one beneficiary seems to be raccoons and there actually have been some studies uh, with simulated nest at least looking at how the feeder is influencing nest success of you know simulated yep. nests in any way. And uh yep. and it's not good. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh I know the South Georgia study, uh I, I think it was led or at least one of the co-authors was Mike Connor down on Jones Center. And uh they I, f- I forget the details of it, but they saw elevated nest predation within like 300 yards of the feeder. It was sustained out that far in the, you know, these simulated nests, and they didn't go any farther because they didn't think there was any reason to. So basically, the full span of distance they went away from the feeder, there was more nest predation associated with the feeder. So doesn't it seem a little bit What's the right word here? Uh, I, don't, I don't. It's counterintuitive for us to be really uh, pointing blame at predators like raccoons, and then be engaging in a practice, or at least a lot of people, that might be facilitating that problem. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would. I guess I would suggest the listener, at a minimum. Consider ways that you can reduce potential non-targets getting access. I mean, I, I think you should go further and even think about what's my what's truly my objective with the feeding. Is this meeting my objective? And have an honest, uh, you know, internal discussion about that, and and ask some biologists and get some input. Whatever you need to do, but at a minimum, if you do nothing else, just make it such that raccoons can't get to the feed or you reduce the likelihood they do. And, and we'll talk about some ways you can do that. Simple things, even changing the bait that you put out, the feed you put out can make a difference. For example, we found that uh, raccoons feed uh, much less on Milo than they do corn. I don't, I can't explain why that is, but our visitation rates to Milo are dramatically lower Mm -hmm. than visitation rates for corn for raccoons but deer eat milo just fine so you know there are some simple things that you can do that will reduce the likelihood that you're supplementally feeding your predator community because as you said marcus very counterintuitive Mm -hmm. to other objectives that you might have on your property well it just seems like every 
I, I just see it all the time. We're really fast to jump on changes in predator communities and the predator density being the real problem for turkeys and even a cause of decline. And, you know, everyone jumps on that bandwagon to the degree that it even seems like it will get really upset if you suggest otherwise. And I know, mm-hmm. uh, again, you can email will.goolsby at auburn.edu if you want to <laughs> if you want to uh, vent about what we're saying here. But, you know, that I, I don't yeah, understand. Any com- <laughs> That's the complaint department. Yeah, that, that's where you send all your complaints. <laughs> so uh, anyway, it, it's just really interesting to me. Like even suggesting something about feeding like that just provokes this visceral response, it seems like, with a lot of people. Like you've personally attacked them. And I mean, it just seems like this counter to what we're saying could be a you know if if what we're saying is a real issue that could be helping facilitate that issue based on some of that evidence we have experimental evidence to suggest the uh, nest predation at least with simulated nests uh, that is a problem and you i mean if you calculate the area if we did a radius around what they showed elevated you know predator effects that's like six, that's almost 60 acres mm-hmm. associated with mm-hmm. that feeder. Yep. So th- now yeah. think about how many do you have on the landscape? I've seen some estimates in some places. I'm not going to specify where, uh, that we have feeder densities much higher than that, like more than one per 60 acres. And now we're talking about, okay, we're elevating predation potentially from multiple feeding sources, potentially across the majority of the landscape. And that, that to me is really concerning and it doesn't get talked about very much. And this is without even talking about, you know, concerns related to aflatoxicosis or, you know, feral pig supplementation as well, which, you know, with feral pigs, I worry a lot more about, you know, food, resource competition Mm -hmm. between feral pigs and turkeys and I do nest predation, but, um, still calls for concern. So, yeah, I mean, it's a practice that could potentially have negative multi-pronged negative effects, I think. And we, and will you mentioned aflatoxin, we know, uh, that turkeys are particularly vulnerable to aflatoxin toxicity. I mean, that's, that's been known in the poultry world Mm -hmm. for decades. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we also know, based on a variety of studies, and I think some of your work has you looked at this, Dwayne, uh, that we know, at least with corn, when it's being fed in these hot, humid places, that it is, I mean, I, I think the Mississippi State study showed 100% of this, the corn that they sampled at feeders, 100% of those samples had aflatoxins at levels that were unsafe and, for yeah. turkey consumption. Yeah, a lot of it that is purchased that that, that it, for the wildlife uh, feed industry, you know, it's not it. A lot of it has not been tested, so we don't you don't know what's in it. But even if you started with aflatoxin free grain, like let's say you only bought USDA certified corn that has been tested mm-hmm. in theory, uh, so it's we did that aflatoxin free. In other words, it should be. Yeah, I mean, if it you know it, that that's the certification says it should be. We started with aflatoxin free grain and put it in the environment. Within ten or fourteen days, it was at levels that could be acutely lethal to a wild turkey if they ate enough of it. Mm-hmm. So it's in, you know, it's in the air. We're breathing it right now. I mean, the aspergillus, the fungus is everywhere. So even if you start with, you know, quote, clean grain um, under the right environmental circumstances, it, it's still going to get on there. Mm-hmm. So that's definitely something that, that, you know, people that are feeding also need to consider. I'm glad Will brought that up. That's, yeah. that's not, we don't, we don't have any evidence that that's causing population declines, but we know enough about aflatoxin that we should be a little concerned about that. Yeah. We should, we should try to mitigate for that risk. Well, I was interested in one of the things that you said about switching the feed type. When you, 
it sounded like you've done some work with switching from corn to sorghum. Mm-hmm. Did you still still see the same deer use? I thought yes, there was no st- no statistical difference. Wow. And it was a bocky design. We the feeders would go back and forth, mm-hmm. and yeah, there was no statistical difference in deer use, but dramatic reduction in raccoon use. That's and, really interesting. You know, I'm not I'm not putting a plug in for the sorghum industry or anything. Are you, but it's just, are you being paid it's by just the, the, <laughs> I'm actually not. Maybe I should be. But this is just the facts. Uh, sorghum has a different carbohydrate structure and it actually accumulates aflatoxin at a slower rate. Mm-hmm. It still grows aspergillus, but it's at a slower rate than corn. So that's another side byproduct of using sorghum over corn. How does it compare from a cost perspective? It's variable. I mean, you know, I know when we did that study, uh, it was it was pretty much a wash, but it all depends on market conditions. I mean, it, it can be higher. It can be cheaper. Some places it's just hardly not available. That's what I, people yeah. know. It's they're like, I can't get sorghum, but, you know, I'm, I'm living in a part of the world where it's grown, so it's readily available. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. The, the other thing that we're not, uh, when we think about cost, people aren't thinking about where the feed is actually ending up. And if it's, if, you know, half of it is ending up in the belly of a raccoon, it might Absolutely. be more cost-effective, cost mm-hmm. even though it may be a higher sticker price. Yeah, if you looked at the cost yeah. per pound consumed by deer, it would yeah. it would be a very different calculation, probably. That's right. Well, I suspect you might even get higher use from other game birds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, and that was another thing we did notice. Uh, higher bird use of the Milo mm. feeders than as compared to corn. Yeah. So that's probably just uh, a palatability, like a size issue. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, it definitely is a interesting thing. And we're on this podcast, we're trying not to shy away from things like this that we know are going to be controversial. We're instead trying to direct them to Will <laughs> uh, So I'm but, just gonna lean, I'm just gonna lean right into that, Marcus, and and put Dwayne on the spot if he doesn't mind. I probably shouldn't do that, him being our guest, but well, we can yeah. edit it out if he minds. That's fine. Would you would you, you know, given everything that we've discussed here, you know, if you're a if you're a turkey hunting enthusiast, would you feed corn on your property? Absolutely not. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. We uh, we own and manage property in Georgia that's intensively managed for wild turkey, and we do not feed. The only feed we do uh, is to trap what whatever's necessary to trap pigs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that that actually is another interesting thing. I'm glad you put him on the spot, Will. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, you didn't ask me if I trap predators, Will. Well, I was getting to that. Well, one. I, 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 I was, was thinking about circle. I was asking for us to circle back around because that that yeah. one that one crossed my mind earlier too. Okay. Well, I was I kinda, just like, maybe I should let the conversation mature a bit. Yeah. <laughs> we need to go ahead, Marcus. We need to get to know each other better before we really. <laughs> no, uh, so I, I kind of got pulled in two directions, and I'm trying to decide which way to go. So I think I'm going to go with the kind of a little bit away, since you're going to circle back there, Will. Uh, I see it, and, and here recently, I've seen it multiple times where people talk about, you know, something comes up online. And of course, all of these things are inflammatory and they just blow up online, especially on some uh, platforms. But the response to the feeder supplementing predators and all that sort of stuff as well, use that as an opportunity to trap predators next to the feeders. Uh-huh. So... I guess I'm, I'm not sure if I have a question or if I'm just making that <laughs> statement to see where y'all go with it. But it's really interesting to me that uh, that would be the the default response is not we need to do something about the feeding. We need to take that as an opportunity to do something about the predator problem that we're potentially creating, or at least supplementing uh, with that practice. So it's just 
it's interesting to me that people need it to be about predators. And that kind of, even when there's something that we know indirectly might be influencing predation that we're saying is the problem, we still double down on predators. Like with our management action, like this. Yeah, and I think, I also think that there's a difference between doing that practice around, you know, a corn pile versus a trough feeder with protein feed where somebody's trying to just max out antler size on a property or something like that, you know? Because mm-hmm. um, I feel like that's where, uh, I don't know, they're trying to achieve two different objectives there. One is just attract a deer and one is actually provide a nutritional supplement to a deer that'll result in larger antlers. So I don't know that I would put them in the same, in the same box. Oh, so you mean like if you're with the protein feeding, maybe that is an opportunity to trap predators as well or. Yeah. I mean, if, if you, if that is, if you identified that as a step necessary to achieving your, your objectives, your wildlife management objectives, I think you're more justified in trapping around those areas versus, you know, just trapping around a, a corn pile. I don't know. I'm trying to, I'm, my, my thoughts are evolving as I talk about this and I, yeah. I don't know. I'm, I have mixed feelings about it. And, you know, I think it, you do have to think about your objective. Like Will said, you know, if you're feeding to achieve some objective that's been identified as a limiting factor, so be it. Um, but just to throw it out for those that maybe don't have experience trapping raccoons or opossums, you don't have to put a feeder up to catch oh, yeah. a simple sardine, a sardine or a cotton ball with some scent put on it works just fine. Mm-hmm. They are not hard to attract. Yeah. I can remember when I was a kid kind of learning how to try out the can of sardines that we would be carrying around. Mar- yep. Remarkably effective. Yeah. I mean, I've caught, man, I don't know how many raccoons just using like, you know, coyote urine and coyote gland lure when we're trying to catch coyotes and they'll come into that too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, anything that will stick its arm down in a hole and grab a hold of something and not let go and you can <laughs> catch it that way. You know, <laughs> I mean, it really, me as a seven year old being able to go out and set up a trap and be successful, I don't tell you, you know, that it's, that most people could accomplish that without having yeah. the feet around. All right, Will. It rains are back to you. <laughs> Dwayne, do you trap on your property? <laughs> I'm going to throw out a disclaimer before I answer that question and say that those folks that are listening to us should know that what I'm about to say is not implying that's what they should right. do. Because every property, every situation is context specific. But on the property that we manage for Turkey, we, a few years ago, did start very targeted predator control for wild turkey. And the reason we did that is I ran out of habitat improvements to make. I mean, I was kind of at the end of the line. I could not think of anything else that was deficient on that property, short of buying more property and Mm -hmm. just having, you know, a mm-hmm. bigger landscape but short of that we we're kind of out of options and the turkey numbers were still disappointingly low and uh, after talking with some colleagues that i trusted very well that knew a lot more about predator di- and prey dynamics than i did and really diving into the literature um, i thought it was a possibility on our property that that because we weren't seeing very many poults from cameras cameras that we had out we saw very few poults and uh, we saw lots of raccoons and opossums. So we, for a few years, we did a targeted trapping right before nesting season. And anecdotally, and I have to say anecdotally, because as a scientist, we did not have a control. The only control I had was talking to Georgia DNR and asking them regionally what a turkey numbers look like. Um, and we didn't have transmitters on these birds. But anecdotally, um, w- there did appear to be a, f- a fairly dramatic change. In, in turkey numbers. So it, it, it was, it was, it was noticeable. Sure. And it could, it could have been unrelated to the predator trapping, but, but we, we did observe uh, higher numbers of turkeys during those years. So I have two follow-up questions to that. One is I want to, I want to hear more about 
you know, what your trapping efforts intensity look like. But before we get to that one, I just wanted to throw that out there. So I don't forget before we get to it. Um, could you go th- through and explain a little bit about, you know, you said you ran out of habitat improvement or maintenance projects to do. Uh, I'm assuming that's more than just, you know, planting a couple food plots here and there. Oh my and, gosh. Yes. Well, and, and, <laughs> but, and the reason I say that is because I think that there are a lot of hunters and landowners out there that think, you know, they plant a few food plots. They've really gone above and beyond with oh, habitat no. and I'm not, and I'm not disparaging those people. I, I want to make them aware of what are all the options that are on the table. So if you could, yeah. you know, walk us through that list a little bit. Yeah, this was after years of of focused habitat improvements, and we're talking timber thinning, uh, timber stand improvement, removal of invasive species, both herbaceous and woody invasive species, prescribed fire in some cases, uh, fire every two years. In other areas, it was every three to four, so that we had structural heterogeneity. Uh, I mean, these are small scale fires. I mean, a lot of these, we were, we were down to the point of, you know, burning five and eight acres, 20 acres at a time. I mean, trying to create just a lot of heterogeneity so that a turkey couldn't be anywhere on this property and not have nesting cover and, and early brood cover and late brood cover all in close proximity. So we were burning it multiple times of the year. Um, and it, I mean, it's good. It, it's really nice. I mean, I could you know, I could use that as an example to write a fact sheet on how to manage Eastern wild turkey. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, it, there were food plots, uh, clover, just basically so that when I show up in April, I, I, I've got a place that I know to start because mm-hmm. there's probably going probably to be turkeys hanging around those clover plots. But that was more for hunting than, than to increase turkey numbers. So, yeah, very intensive management, uh, not just throwing a couple of food plots on the ground. So you're talking about a process that took you years to implement. And then within each of those years, weeks and weeks and weeks of work and effort and energy yeah. to accomplish all those projects. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, um, it, and a lot of cost share assistance, my, my mother-in-law, bless her heart. I mean, she, she's done a wonderful job navigating USDA programs to help you know, pay for all these actions. And uh, so a lot of technical assistance from agencies and, um, you know, a lot of on the ground work and years of habitat improvements. And I I have to say that the turkeys responded to all Mm. that. I mean, it's not that habitat didn't matter. We definitely saw a marked increase in the turkey numbers across the property to the point that the neighbors were even talking about it. Like, you know, my gosh, you know, I mean, we were getting spillover, but, um, but then it, you know, we hit a level where um, I just felt like with the habitat we sh- had, I was unsatisfied with the turkey numbers we had. Sure. Um, now, does that that does not mean that predator control is warranted for everybody listening to the sound of our voice? It does not mean that at all. But what I think it, what I think this gets circled back around is literature is pretty clear on game birds where we have data that when habitat is, has been met, there are very often, not always, but very often is data to support that predator control can increase prey abundance. I think, I think I can say that with a straight face that I don't, I don't have any concern saying that, but that does not translate to mean that it's always going to work. Mm-hmm. And certainly will, I think to your point, if somebody's not done all those habitat improvements, it don't expect much from predator yeah. control. Yeah. And so once you, once you decided to implement the predator control program, could you give us some specifics about that? And, you know, kind of starting with the, the property size and you will, you kind of density of traps and, th- and types yeah. of traps and things like that duration. Mm-hmm. The, the, the entire property was not trapped. Uh, the part that was, was about 400 acres and, it was about a three-week period of trapping with only live catch traps. We were really trying to target opossums and raccoons. Mm-hmm. And uh, because based on the cameras, the camera surveys that we did, that seemed to be, those were very, very abundant. And, and it was done as late as we legally could under the then current Georgia uh, uh, fur bear right. guidelines. Now, they've since relaxed that. I think, I think uh, you can trap raccoons. Well, I don't want to 
I don't want to say because I'm not positive, but it, it's changed. So if you're in Georgia, look at your regulations. But at that time, there was a cutoff, and um, we went up to that cutoff, right. which was as close close to nesting season as we could get. Mm-hmm. So again, it was very strategic. You know, we weren't trapping in August. We were trapping as late in the year as we possibly could to give give our, to try to hold the predator numbers down as long as possible to give the turkey, which are fairly synchronous nesters, mm-hmm. right? Very different from Bob White. Bob White might nest for six months a year. You know, turkeys, they can, they can re, obviously they do re-nest, but they're much more synchronous nesters than Bob White are. So we were really trying to target that early spring nesting period. Mm-hmm. Oh, and as far as trap density, you asked about that. I think we had out, as best I recall, that 400 acres, somewhere in the vicinity of 25 or 30 traps. Check daily. Yeah. That's so intense. Tw- so 25 traps oh, yeah. for three weeks. What you said. And let me, and let me just say, I can't remember the, yeah, two to three weeks. I can't remember the exact numbers removed off the top of my head, but just to give the listener an idea of how many meso predator, meso carnivores like a possum that there can be on a property. We caught, and obviously we didn't catch them all, but we caught about one animal per three to four acres trapped okay mm-hmm. you th- think about that yeah, yeah. that that is a high dense and i've heard other landowners with much higher trap rates than mm-hmm. that you know where they're catching one per acre essentially during a short period of time so th- th- there's a lot in some properties there can be a really high density mm-hmm. of op- opossums raccoons um skunks armadillos, whatever. Um, Dwayne had brought up a couple of things. One, I, Will and I have tried to uh, remind the listeners about this. There, there are a lot of people that have this, we'll call it anecdotal because it's not in a robust experimental design, but there are a lot of landowners that swear by trapping and that are in a similar situation where they feel that they've seen a really big bump. And um, we've kind of kept our, you know, hesitation l- trying to limit that to the fact that we don't have very good experimental data to quantify what that looks like and cost per gain and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that that's interesting that you you've had that same sort of experience. It sounds like, and I think they uh, should one, they should be skeptical of anecdotal evidence. I'm I'm yeah. I'm skeptical of what I've just told you because as I said yeah. it was not a controlled experiment but I think well, that it, another thing is we all when we do something we want it to work and there's mm-hmm. confirmation bias associated yes. with that uh so definitely keep that in mind but I also don't want it you know we, we constantly keep coming back and caveating and it makes it seem like we're trying to talk people out of it and that's not my intent uh I just want to be skeptical. Uh-huh. A healthy bit of skepticism is is uh, warranted, especially in circumstances like this where we don't have really good experiments. Uh, but I was curious, something that Will and I have talked about, I, I can't recall if we talked about it on the podcast, Will, or if it was just conversations that we've had. I feel like we have talked about it on the air, but if, if not, what did... Dwayne, just from your your anecdote, your gut feeling as a researcher who's very knowledgeable about managing game birds and the the effectiveness of habitat versus the effectiveness of trapping, I'm curious. You, you sounded like you perceived a an increase in turkeys following the intensive habitat and then following the intensive predator control. Mm-hmm. What what did they look like relative to one another in terms of their effect size of, and maybe even costs associated with it? You mean how um, how many more turkeys do we think we had on the properties? That is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. yeah like did you how many more gobblers? We basically oh okay. So you know if I had to spitball it and say how much did habitat management contribute versus how much did predator um, control contribute, my gut my best gut g- guesstimate would be the habitat management probably would explain 80%. Mm-hmm. 
of the turkey change, whereas the predator control was probably only 20%. But it was a 20% bump that I couldn't seem to get get by with with the habitat work we were doing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and as far as um, what that meant on the ground, you know, from our camera, summer camera surveys, we basically went from hardly ever seeing poults show up to regularly seeing poults show up. And this this persisted for the three years that we did the predator control. And I mm-hmm. think I told you this, Marcus, but because of extenuating circumstances, we stopped doing the predator control. And um, now, you know, turkey numbers appear to be right back to where they were before we started. Wow. Um, and again, that's very anecdotal, but you know, this is how as a scientist hypotheses are formed. Like, you know, yeah. you have observations and, and I've worked with, as you said, I've worked with landowners that have similar anecdotal observations. In some cases they have data even, and uh, it's, you know, it's not uh, controlled experiments, but they have pretty good data on uh, estimates of turkeys on their property and how many predators they removed, et cetera. And, you know, when enough evidence accumulates, it makes me as a scientist want to really quantify this. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's where we're at right now. It's like, I want to do a very well done controlled research project to evaluate what, what is the likely effect size of doing targeted predator control on yeah. wild turkey. And not to say that that's going to be the answer for agencies or even landowners, but at least when a landowner or biologist ask me, what do we think the potential uh, effect would be? I can give them some empirical data that's not based on gray partridge in the UK or based on, (laughs) or based on my anecdotal observation from South Georgia, because all of that has to be viewed with some level of skepticism as it should be. Well, I think Will and I've gone through this at nauseam probably already on the podcast that like we'd need an experiment like that. Yeah. It, the, it, it really, you know, you were talking about how unbelievable it is really that we don't have more data on turkeys. That, like that's the most common issue, prob- or at least one of the top ones that comes up is whether or not uh, predators are the problem and whether or not predator trapping is the answer. And there seems to be this sharp division over that issue and to, uh, it's hard to believe that we don't have more experimental data to address that. Like, we, we just need that data. And another thing, I can see Will's itching right here. To jump you in. read me too well. <laughs> I was, I was <laughs> just going to clarify, and you know this, Marcus, that, uh, that you know, it's not a it's not a either or predators are limiting or predators are not. There's probably some areas where they are and some areas where they're not. Yeah. There's other contributing factors that are limiting, you know, and there's different combinations as you go from one place to another. But yeah. I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be misleading if I was. But uh, another thing, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Dwayne. Uh, so hold that thought. But. Another thing, the reason I asked you that question about habitat versus trapping, I think that we need them together so that we know what is the relative effect that you're going to see out of intensive habitat management and then intensive predator management with no habitat and then the practices together. Like we really need that sort of study over many different contexts so that we can understand what's uh, affecting the relative benefits of each practice and then how they augment one another. Uh, you know, that's, that's just something that is needed. It's unbelievable to me, given how often this comes up, that we don't yeah. have it. And we, we hinted at this earlier, but just I think that your point that you just made is so important. Circle back around. To the, in the Bob White world, um, there that has been made very clear with research that the habitat has to be in place before you can expect Mm -hmm. a response from both predator control and also supplemental feeding. That's not really the gist of what we're talking about today, but that's another area that they've documented a bump to Bob White numbers in the context of a big landscape of habitat. So Mm -hmm. you're right. Those, those things are, are, are 
are interrelated and, and not independence, not either or. Um, so I think that's uh, that's the kind of honest conversation we need to have with landowners, and we need to do a better job of quantifying how much of an effect the predator control is likely to have. And we've talked a lot today about nest predators, but it's more complicated than that. There's also predators of adult turkey. And I think for game birds, we tend to focus on reproduction a lot because, Mm -hmm. you know, they're relatively short-lived and we know how much production drives population trajectory. But turkeys, they're a little longer lived than most game birds. And so adult predation, uh, shouldn't be off the table we should be thinking about that as well and there actually is some data out there from um greg harper you know back back in north carolina uh indication that you know bobcats can be a pretty limiting factor on adult wild turkey or hen survival Mm -hmm. and and that was done i mean we're all getting old craig craig's getting old with us that was done a while ago back when you know, before mm-hmm. bobcats were as abundant as they are now across the landscape. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we haven't really talked about adult predators very much, but that's another area of, mm-hmm. of really where there's not a lot of data. But the data yeah. we do have suggests that they can limit wild turkey survival pretty remarkably, at least in some situations. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a good point because you think about the population level consequences of losing one nest and a clutch of eggs that it contains versus losing a hen in her lifetime of reproduction. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a bad loss. Especially if that happens to be one of the super producers that produce the majority of the offspring, which is apparently the case with with turkeys. Uh, Another thing that just popped into my head, since we are uh, hopefully reaching at least a few people with this podcast, uh, (laughs) It'd also be quite interesting if we could devise a strategy for some citizen science on this, where maybe uh, we have landowners that they've been intensively predator trapping and maybe they take a year off or a couple of years off or, or the opposite where somebody's been thinking about, man, I just I need to get to that next level. I think predators are the problem and they're about to engage in that. If we could get that before or after thing on a bunch of properties with some sort of sampling design you know everybody has trail cameras just about now the days i wonder if we could come up with some sort of hand to pole ratio or something that'd be really interesting to at least see when we aggregate all those data from a bunch of people do we consistently see that effect and it'd be stronger than you know these one-off uh examples that each individual landowner has yeah Mm -hmm. maybe another strategy to think about yeah i'm sure that data would be really noisy you know there would be a lot of variation between properties and so if we if we did something like that we'd be have to be really careful to set it up in a way that we could kind of tease out Mm. why what's causing the variation you know, probably, right. a lot of it would probably go back to well, how good was the habitat to begin with? What did the yeah. tur- what did the turkey population look like across the landscape? Is this an island of habitat? Okay, or- okay, it was a bad idea, guys. No, I think it's a great <laughs> idea, but we're just gonna have to talk about it for like five hours. Yeah. I was I was right there with Dwayne as Mark was Marcus was describing this. I was just thinking, oh my God, how many criteria are we gonna have to force on these landowners to try to insert, ensure some kind of rigor? But <laughs> only the people that are completely vested that's, yeah. that's the first thing yeah you got to be all in yeah. Dwayne there was there was one there was one thing you said earlier that I wanted to circle back to and that was that um you guys only trapped for three years right yes and you and you feel like you are continuing to enjoy the same numbers that you had when you were trapping well interestingly uh the first year by far the highest catch was opossum Mm-hmm. And in the subsequent years, we never saw uh, opossum catches like that. But the raccoons, it was like the same number every year. So, and, I, and you know, there's not a lot known. I actually, I'd spent a day looking in the literature on the subject because it got me curious. So I was really trying to figure out home range size and dispersal uh, distances of raccoons versus opossum. And again, shockingly, there wasn't as much published on that subject as you'd think there might be but from what i could glean uh you know possum opossum have much smaller home ranges generally and they're not as 
they don't disperse as far as best we know. So my guess is that they just hadn't had time to fill back in. And since that made up by volume, a huge proportion of the meso predator biomass, so to speak, on the landscape, you know, there, there did seem to be a time lag that in subsequent years, we just never caught very many again after that first year. Now, there could be another explanation. You know, there could have been a disease in opossums that something unaccounted for that I just I couldn't know about. Mm-hmm. But as best I could tell from the limited data we had, it did appear that there was a time lag on the opossum. But the raccoons, they seem to be just filling right back in very quickly. You, do you think that, uh, I mean, currently you're still happy with your turkey numbers? No, I'm not. Right. No. Because we, <laughs> we haven't started trapping again. <laughs> okay. So you're, but you are planning on going again. If I live closer to Georgia, yeah. It's just, yeah. A, it's a lot to ask my family members to do because they're, yeah. they were doing the work. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so how, I guess you, you trapped for three years and then did I understand correctly? You were happy with it, and then then the hurricane mm-hmm. hit, you know, and uh, yeah, we, and got, we got numbers. busy. We got busy doing other stuff like clean up. So, so again, there's a confounding problem. A- absolutely. Uh, yeah, was well, I was just kind of curious, like, did, if you trapped intensively for three years, did you see that carry on for several years? So it sounds like the hurricane probably confounded your it, it, yeah. Your, there's your such a kink and everything. I mean, there was you know, so many trees down. And I, I think you just kind of put a big asterisk beside that. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Frustrating to say the least. It is. <laughs> and it makes, you know, it makes it really hard to talk, talk to landowners about this. You know, there's a lot of folks out there that really want to know what the evidence suggests. And it's, um, it's just not solid. It's not something that, you know, as I said earlier, we can't say yes or no. But I, I can say there's enough evidence that I can't dismiss it. You know, I can't yeah. I can't tell a landowner, no, there's no evidence that predator control would ever potentially affect a you know a ground nesting bird. Well, that that's not the case. And I've also mm-hmm. stopped, and Marcus and I've talked about this before. I've stopped telling them that something's cost prohibitive. I used to do that a lot, and I finally caught myself like, you know what? That's a relative issue. What's cost prohibitive to one landowner is not even yeah. worth considering to another landowner and they have to decide that for themselves i think what our job is to try to help them understand what the potential effect size might be and how much time and effort and money it might take and then it's on them to decide if it's worth it or not mm-hmm. absolutely yeah and I, and I think that that marcus as we start to uh kind of wind down all the predator stuff that we've been talking about you know in the past several episodes to put a to put a bow on this, I think the general theme has been that, you know, without a doubt, predators eat turkeys, you know, and they eat a lot of them. Um, and predator removal might be a way to help address some of that, but it's not a one-to-one ratio. We're trying to temper their expectations, make them understand all the, all the reasons why it may not be as effective as they had hoped and, and just kind of give some realistic expectations. And at the same time, make sure that they're aware of these other more fundamental, you know, habitat components that they need to make sure are in place before they, um, they, for, they go on that journey that is predator control. Yeah. I think that's a pretty good way to put it. it. It's not just as simple as we would love it to be. Yeah. I, I think I just add to that. I would really encourage land managers, whether we're talking about private landowners or state agency biologists that are managing a WMA, I've just asked them to critically think about this. Mm -hmm. To look at the evidence or lack thereof before they make decisions on what they should do Mm -hmm. about predators. And it's hard sometimes, I think, in that regard to be honest with yourself and 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 really admit the other potential gaps in your management that exist. Mm -hmm. You know, like have you been burning the way that you need to burn? Are you managing your timber the way that you need to manage it? You know, what's going on with your invasives? What does your understory composition look like in response to these practices that you're using? And, and, and don't try to, you know, it's tempting to try to sidestep that and just go, you know, buy a bunch of traps and put them out. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Well, but it's not um, it's not as productive to do that. And our tendency, Will, as we've discussed several times, is to go the opposite way and just kind of, you know, assume just ignore the the predator yeah part of it and and go all in on habitat, which may not be the complete solution either. No, I think it's important just for us to all think about, particularly on this. Think you reflect on why why are you. Why well, is your stance where it is? Is it based on evidence or not? You know, lack of evidence is not necessarily opposing, you know, a, a viewpoint. So just because we don't have evidence with turkeys that trapping is really effective all the time does not mean that trapping is effective all the time. It means we don't have the evidence to be confident to tell you that. Mm-hmm. And and, uh, don't interpret that as it's not effective just because we don't have evidence that it is. It's not necessarily the case or or vice versa. I was just using one one direction as as to make the point. And I, you know, I think about that a lot when I'm talking, you know, I talked to a lot of landowners about Bob White management and, you know, the way I kind of try to approach that is I can tell them with a high level of confidence that if they manage their forest in this way, they're going to see a Bob White population response. But then when they ask about predator control, I have to say, well, yeah, it's possible, but I have much lower confidence, you know, mm-hmm. and kind of give them a range of expectations, you know, and I think this gets back to just levels of uncertainty and being honest with them that there are some things we have higher certainty based on the evidence and other things like predator control that we have less certainty. And, I, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I give people credit to have enough sense to make good decisions if you have an honest conversation with them. Mm-hmm. But that takes more than a five second yes or no. Mm-hmm. We, we as right. biologists have to spend the time to have these hard conversations. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good ending point. Sounds great to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I really enjoy talking with you. Yeah, it's fun. Fun conversation. Yeah, I really appreciate your insight and for taking some time with us. Yeah, thanks for taking some of these controversial issues head on. Yeah, just remember, will.goldsby at Auburn. (laughs) 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 Y'all are going to have people firing off emails in all directions. Oh, mercy. So far, there's not been one that is going to end up in my inbox. (laughs) (laughs) this is the one time i've actually been thankful that auburn gave me a weird address that's like an alphanumeric code so (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah it is kind of weird uh but in all seriousness folks out there are really interested in in, uh getting a hold of us will and i both are pretty easy to find on social media or whatever and uh, Dwayne, if you don't mind we'll Attach some some contact information for you as well. Absolutely. I'd be glad to talk to anybody. In the show notes. And for folks out there that, you know, if you're enjoying the podcast or if you're finding it controversial or you want one of your buddies to hear it, feel free to share this with other people. That's really what is going to make this successful so that we can continue to have these, mm-hmm. these tough discussions. So we appreciate any help, you know, sharing it with your, your buddies and friends and family. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think that's a wrap, guys. Okay. All right. Appreciate it, Dwayne. Thank you all. Wild Turkey Science is part of the Natural Resources University Podcast Network and is made possible by Turkeys for Tomorrow, a grassroots organization dedicated to the wild turkey. To learn more about TFT, check out turkeysfortomorrow.org.